You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. I wanted to introduce, without further ado, our good friend uh, Ellie uh, Pierce. Ellie, welcome back to the Final Say. I hope I'm a little bit more stable this time. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, you are stable, and uh, uh, but, but I've. I'm still not sure I'm going to trust you flying my airplane, but that's only because I'm not, I don't think you have a pilot's license. <laughs> you're, you're a very smart guy. So. <laughs> yeah, I've been called worse. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Ellie, uh, as I mentioned, yeah. is, uh, is an ad- advocate, a huge advocate, a man-on-the-street advocate, a man-in-the-know advocate for uh, U.S.-Israeli relationships and the uniqueness of that relationship. Um, and you know, Ali, when we first uh, met, you were uh, you were uh, very specifically advocating for the uh, Yesha Council. And I wanted to pick up on our conversation the other day because after we got on the whole, uh, got off the call, it occurred to me that you know I look at I want to make just a quick comparison here before I ask for your comments. One of the most troubling aspects to me of the entire six-year experience of Obama, and it didn't start with him, but it's, it, it got exponentially worked with him, with him, is we don't, we don't have a competing uh, opinions, right? We don't have competing public opinions that, that manifest themselves in elections. We literally have like a divided nation where if you don't agree with me, you're inherently evil. It's character assassination at the finest. <laughs> you look to your leader to be the one to help bring that together and to heal those divisions. And in the case of Obama, we have somebody who does the exact opposite. And so when I got off the phone with you, it occurred to me that Obama has taken that exact same uh, you know, character flaw, I'll just call it outright what I believe it to be, and has injected that into the Israeli-U.S. Uh, relationship and, and what really concerns me, and I want you to comment on this from two perspectives. One, I want, I want you to give us a, a little bit of insight as to how you, how you think his relationship has both hurt the relationship between Israel and the U.S., but on the flip side, how you think maybe his, his meddling has actually uh, created a scenario where Israelis left, right, and center might have a greater recognition on the need to really think about security first. Well, I really appreciate that. And actually, um, if I can, I'd like to back up and, and, t- and connect the last thing you were talking about, the instability of the co-pilot um, of the plane that appeared to be have crashed on purpose. Um, talk about unstable people causing damage. You were talking about President Obama, a stable person who is causing a tremendous amount of damage. Um, and I think that there is some similarity. Some of the things that he's been doing um, could be seen as almost unstable, um, but the damage is widespread. What President Obama has been doing is, since the beginning of his uh, presidency is to try to demonstrate that the left-wing attitude towards international affairs um, has been correct and that the right wing has been, the neocons have been right have been wrong um, and he started by going to Egypt um, in the beginning part of his presidency and trying to reset our relationship with the Arab world um, we have a famous picture of him bowing down to the Saudi sheiks um, and obviously playing very hardball with Israel that started at the very beginning of his presidency and it continues um, to this day right now <clears throat> what I would say is that certainly Israelis and I believe the Jewish American community, and I think the, the American community in general, is starting to see that President Obama's over-the-top condescending behavior towards Israel, stubbornness, um, the comparison and the con- contrast between how he interacts and how he deals with the Iranians versus how he deals with the Israelis, is so dramatic, is so out of line that everybody's beginning to see that this is not a, um, a this, what is happening between the, the U.S. and Israel is really something happening between President Obama and either Netanyahu or, or in Israel, that it's an Obama issue. And what I think the opportunity that we have is to parlay that in his face during the Israeli elections. Um, it is quite clear that the Obama, the White House, that the Obama campaign machine was in Israel very actively involved trying to run in anything but Bibi Netanyahu campaign, trying to uh, affect regime change. The place where she's doing a regime change would be Iran or some of the other horrific dictators in the Middle East. 
Uh, the place that you should not be doing that is a legitimate democracy, because that's exactly what Obama did. What I think is becoming evident is that this is an Obama obsession. Um, and even left-wing Jewish supporters of Israel in, in the United States are starting to be more and more uncomfortable with President Obama's actions. And I am extremely hopeful that the Democratic Party will start shifting the, um, you know, as they're moving into presidential campaigns and, uh, and Democratic primaries, and they're picking who their candidates are. I'm hoping they're going to learn a significant lesson from President Obama, which is either behave friendly, conciliatory as an ally to Israel, or focus on a different part of the world, because you're not going to fix it. Um, either one of those conclusions would be beneficial. Um, and I think what we need to do is we need to contain the damage that President Obama is doing just within President Obama, focus it on him, and then it'll reflect back positively. The more it became evident in the Israeli elections that President Obama was engaged in the campaign, the more it absolutely backfired in his face. Um, I've seen a number of articles that have spoken about that. I, I can say that being in Israel, being aware of it, being aware um, in the Israeli press, how much it was covering. Um, though initially, the discussion was, is this legal or illegal? I know there was discussion in, the, in, in America about whether U.S. taxpayer dollars was involved and there are going to be in, involved in the campaign and there are going to be investigations, congressional investigations on this. I think that is great, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was impropriety. There was initially discussion in Israel whether the, those actions were violated Israeli campaign finance law, which are very, um, very specific and very, very controlled. That was the initial discussion, and that almost was irrelevant, because even if it was legal, even if it was absolutely legal, it still stank, and Israelis didn't like it, and Israelis partially said, no matter, even if I feel uncomfortable with Prime Minister Netanyahu, even if he's been Prime Minister now, it's now his fourth term, um, it was broken up a little bit, but he said he had one term in the 90s, he had two terms here, he's now running his fourth term. And even if people say, hey, I've got BB fatigue, I'm looking for something new. When they saw the extent that, that President Obama was expending to try to go and replace him, Israelis said, hey, we want this guy. This guy's got to be good. Particularly when you look at how, what a mess President Obama has made in the rest of the Middle East. Well, so you didn't but get your head probably uh, nice and snug in your pillow last night until you realized that uh, the, the Sauds and Egyptians and you know UAE and others had had gone in to try to clean up uh, the mess. And this is not to say that the right. mess in Yemen is 100% America's responsibility, but as with everything going on Absolutely. in the Middle East, we were the stabilizing factor. And it's like a bad game of Jenga. The, the president is like a like a drunken monkey playing uh, you know playing uh, Jenga. No, ladies and gentlemen, there's no race attribute to that. Um, it's a, Absolutely. you know, it's things are like kid games that we play that, you know, you, you actually are metaphors for life. And whether, and, and when you, when you, you know, when you play a fool's game and you put that, at, you put that tool out there and you, you just start pulling these things out, it's fun when you're just a bunch of guys hanging out with your buddies in college and it goes, you know, crashes on the floor and every, and somebody drinks another shot. These are these are people's lives. Right. It's American soldiers, it's foreign soldiers, and it's allies. I, I had somebody make a very interesting comment in the uh, in the chat room a little while ago, who was basically mm -hmm. saying, "Is there anybody out there who, at this point, as an enemy, should fear America, and as an ally, should trust America?" And and I want to go back to the first comment that you basically made, Ellie. The president is appears to be a, a, a rational actor. But I think he is actually being the most irrational actor because you have to assume there should not be, and, and you know everybody everybody knows that the Israeli uh, intelligence Mossad is fabulous, but what's the American intelligence machine is massive. There can't possibly be a single person on the world, if they pay attention, who has better AM intelligence briefing sat next to his uh, you know coffee cup than the president of the United States right. of America. So there is no excuse to pretend he didn't know Bergdahl was an actual traitor. There was no excuse to pretend he doesn't know Iran intends to wipe Israel off the map. There is no excuse to pretend their intent isn't to uh, 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 to shut off uh, you know the the Strait of Hormuz, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's what you're speaking to: the sobriety of Israelis, left, right, and center. I want to I want to extend that though, because there's still a concern coming out of the Israeli election that I have is. It seems somehow that 
for all the talk of a two-state solution, that there are still so many people on the left in Israel who don't have the clarity of thought to look at Gaza and say, we are living a failed experiment of a two-state solution. And if that failure follows into the West Bank, Ellie, what would happen? Oh yeah, it, it would be it would be beyond disastrous. It would happen overnight. Um, you know, it, you're, we have my my colleagues here in Israel um, who are on the left. Um, I think I can speak a little bit to where they're coming from. They don't have their hands as much in the sand as as President Obama. Uh, President Obama is pretty much you know he's been wrong on every single instinct he's had, every single ideology when it's come to how to handle the Middle East or its foreign affairs. He's been wrong. So what does he do? He doubled down. He's doubling down. Um, you know he can't he can't admit defeat. He can't admit he was wrong. He has to keep. You know, eventually it'll work. You know, uh, uh, even a broken clock is, is right twice a day, and he's waiting for that first time. You forget about a second time. Um, when it comes to the Israelis here, many of the Israelis, um, and I think that's what happened in this campaign, many of the Israelis have what we, I would call, you know, conflict fatigue. They were in the military. They saw battles up front. They saw probably horrific things. Um, and when they got out of their, their, their mandatory service, they probably said to themselves, you know what, it was worth doing it, I'm saving the country, I'm saving you know, my, my fellow citizens, but I'm going to do everything I can so that by the time my children are ready for their, their mandatory service, that we don't have a conflict. And even though it is somewhat, you know, not dealing with reality, uh, as you pointed out so clearly, they're shooting missiles from Gaza, they will clearly be able to shoot missiles from what is called the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, very, I mean, it, it it overlooks 70% of Israel's population, more than 70% of Israel's economic output. I mean, the country would be paralyzed overnight. Um, just all you have to do is shoot one missile near the airport, which is about five kilometers away. Very, very close. And all, you don't have to hit the, the plane. All you got to do is shoot, the, shoot a missile near the plane. And no planes will be flying. Um, insurance for any plane that would want to try to go anyway would be sky high. Um, it would, our, our economy would come to a stop, and that's all that they need to do. Um, but for many of the Israelis, um, you look at how Israel was formed in 1948, a tiny little country, essentially um, majority or almost a majority made up of Holocaust survivors who are just really struggling to be alive, are being attacked by well-armed um, you know, dozens, I mean, a dozen Arab neighbors trying to wipe us out. The international community didn't step up to, to really protect us. And Israel survived. Kind of miraculous. What happened in 1967, the Six-Day War? Also, kind of miraculous. So at a certain point, Israelis are saying, you know what, it doesn't really make any sense. But 1948 didn't make any sense. The Suez Battle of 56, the Six-Day War in 67, the Yom Kippur War in 73, none of these battles, none of these wars actually made sense that we should win. So, this case, I'm putting my head in the sand a little bit, but I'm sort of believing that it's going to happen anyway. So I, I, I like to, I mean, I like to be able to understand my political adversaries, uh, my colleagues here in Israel who are on the left. They're not my enemies, um, but they're people who I disagree with, and I think they are putting Israel in jeopardy through their policies. So I mean, I definitely fight to uh, make sure that they're not implemented. But I do think that I understand that these are not. You can't compare the left in Israel. Uh, or at least the majority of the left, the mainstream left, to President Obama and somebody who really has no skin in the game. There is very little consequence to what he's doing um, to, from his perspective. Obviously, there's a tremendous consequence to those of us in the area. Um, and obviously, there is also the consequence to America, but he doesn't want to recognize it. Um, so he feels like he can play around. Um, and he feels that he's got a few more years and he's going to keep mixing it around and eventually he'll come up with the right, um, with the right combination that's going to work, even if there is a tremendous amount of collateral damage. You know, they're all a bunch of Arabs. They're all in the Middle East. They don't really know them, um, you know, and he doesn't really care. Um, and I think that he's, you know, he has this policy of just doubling down, getting himself into deeper and deeper trouble, um, and he doesn't really care. I think that's well said. Uh, he, he doesn't care, but I think you also have to always look at who's pulling the puppet strings. And, and you know, mm -hmm. we've had this discussion to some extent before, but there, he is clearly of the uh, so, sovereignty is irrelevant. It's all about the rich versus the poor. And as long as I'm the elitist, the living like the rich, but getting credit for caring about the poor, 
somehow it makes it okay. <laughs> Which to me is exactly Absolutely. And therefore is... an elitist. And exactly. To me, an elitist and that, that's what he wants. Who has a lot of money? It's somebody who has a lot of money and relish, you know, and and wants to, you know, sort of stick it in your face. And 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 he he definitely sort of fills that camp. So I'm, I'm sorry, you were trying to make and it only, you know, and only talk with other elitists. Um, and I think that that is part of it. That his his world is is other left left wingers, other people who have the exact same ideology as him, um, and he doesn't speak with the to, to the average American. Um, he can run good campaigns. He's an attractive enough. He played the race card enough to scare many Amer- Americans into into voting for him. Because otherwise, they might be accused of racism. Um, you can see. I mean, I. I moved from from Seattle in 2010 at the beginning of uh, President Obama's uh, um, presidency, and the, the the amount of race issues that keep coming up over the last four and a half years that I've been here it's just astounding. Um, you know, it, it's sometimes you know when you have that that the, a little bit of space where you know I'm not I don't see it all the time I don't see all of the domestic issues. As clearly as, as you see it and feel it, you know, I get a lot of my domestic, uh, get the pulse of the of domestic issues in the States from uh, Jimmy Fallon or before Gio Leno. Um, and all of a sudden you start seeing how much race is coming up. And that was not the case so much in the, in the 2000s. I think that was a good thing. Um, President Obama has brought it back and he's bringing a lot of baggage, um, which is going to cause, I mean, I believe collateral damage. Um, and it's, it's harming society in the U.S. And it's going to force it to go well beyond, um, well beyond his presidency. I think that the next president, starting in 2000, uh, January 2017, is going to have a lot of work to do to just get us back to where we were in 2008. Well, I think that's true, and that's a domestic problem as well as it is a global problem. But since we're focused on Israel, and mm-hmm. I'm going to stay there. We've got about, sure. uh, let's say, five minutes left. So I want to try to ram through a couple of subject matters really quickly. Staying with the idea of the sure. political left and, and right, uh, B.B. Mm-hmm. has, uh, m- many friends that I have, even on the conservative side in Israel, have made a comment that they think he'll get elected because of the of the Iranian threat, but that many people are not happy with what he's achieved on, a, on the domestic front. Do you think the result of this election, it appears this coalition will actually be more conservative? Do you think that's going to widen the gap in Israel, or what effect do you think that'll have? You know, it's a great point. You know, I think, as I mentioned, this is not BB's fourth term, and I think anybody could see this is, he's not going to do this again. He, you know, he was, like everybody here on the right, everybody was very scared that we were going to lose the government, and, and that would have been quite um, dramatic and drastic. Um, I think this is BB's last term. Um, and as a result, I think this is the time he wants to get stuff done. In the past, because Israel doesn't have a two party system, but we have multiple parties. What Bibi has generally done, he's generally had a left-to-right government, which is seen by the mainstream, by the establishment press, as very, um, you know, generous. Um, this is, you know, it's good consensus. You have both parts of the of the country um, that's being represented, and generally, it's a positive. That that's the way it's perceived. The reality is, it's given Prime Minister Netanyahu a great out. Instead of implementing a lot of center-right policies, whether it's on the national security front, on the economic front, whatever it is, he always has an out that by saying, my left-wing government partners, if they don't like these policies, that these are major policies, they are going to resign from the government and the government will fall and will have to call elections. So he's always able to say, I'm sort of hostage by having a left-wing government. And so that's, and it's been something that has been somewhat popular in the press generally to have a, a right left government generally referred to as a unity government. Um, and it's also sometimes legitimately, uh, Bibi's been able to say, I can't do everything I want to do because my left wing partners will leave. Now, since Bibi is not really going to be running for re-election, um, this is his opportunity. He does have the, the, the strength to put together a, gov- a center right government without any left-wing partners. Um, some of us, some of them are not as strong as the others, um, but all center-right and be able to, be, to move and implement, you know, free market policies domestically, lower the cost of living to a certain extent. The big concern here is the cost of housing. Um, one of the ways to, uh, um, to impact the cost of housing is to stop having construction freezes in Jerusalem, in the rest of Judea and Samaria, that allow um, the market to speak. And when people want to live, allow building to go on. Um, Israel at its core 
was founded really as a socialist experiment and to many extents was somewhat successful, largely because it's very small, people were very dedicated, but it's falling apart as the country is growing um, both in size um, and having it and its economy is growing quite significantly. All of the many of the, the, the socialist components um, are falling away. Free market policies and, and, and certainly in Prime Minister Netanyahu's first um, Prime Ministership back in the 90s implemented quite a few. Um, he has um, uh, what he we hope he will appoint as a finance minister, um, a, a former minister who was responsible for breaking essentially the monopoly on the cell phones. Cell phone bills, monthly bills in Israel would range um, basically a couple hundred dollars and is now lowered to about $15 just because the monopoly was broken for free markets, um, you know, were, were opened. Um, and this is the sort of thing that there's a number of domestic issues along those lines that we could implement if we had a right-wing government. Um, yeah, that's something that BB has the ability to do and we'll do so. Yeah, we'll oh, sure. have about two more quick quickies. And I want to try to stay on, uh, uh, stay a uh, narrow, starting on the housing side. So one of the biggest weapons yeah. that the Europeans have been using against Israel is this whole thing of, uh, forget all the Palestinian terrorists. It's all Israel's fault because Israel continues to build. So I want you to give me a, a, a very kind of a very brief uh, synopsis on um, how do most how do most Isra uh, Israelis, especially those who don't live in Jerusalem, uh, envision Israel continuing to build in East Jerusalem and uh, versus in the uh, occupied territories or what you would like to call Judea and Samaria. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think overall, when you have a situation, I think all Israelis reject the notion that building houses is in some or any way comparable, related to actual terrorist attacks killing people. Um, once you feel that's equivalent, you've lost any kind of moral authority. And I think that's what we say to our European friends, American friends who suggest that uh, that needs to be um, that needs to be um, a red line. Um, when it comes to building, certainly building within Jerusalem, um, you know, it's, it's preposterous that anybody in Israel would think that building in Jerusalem is problematic. Building within Judea and Samaria, since so many Israelis have not visited Judea and Samaria, even though it could be a 10 minute drive from their house. Um, Israel is not a big country, but still many, many Israelis just, you know, live fairly provincially and don't, don't visit our communities. They don't understand the situation that 93% of the area is completely vacant. Only 7% of the West Bank is, is even built up. Um, and that's something that doesn't come across in the press. So when we talk about construction, the reality is it doesn't change anything, unfortunately. Um, but also, um, people don't realize how, how uh, what a small thing that it is, um, but it's always built up, up and up and up. And uh, again, it's one thing that, again, as I mentioned earlier, when President Obama keeps opposing building houses, it pisses off the Israeli public. <laughs> well, good. Maybe that actually works to our advantage. Um, if <laughs> Ellie, before I let you go, and I and I really want to try to hold you to about uh, thirty seconds on this. Just give me a quick heads up sure. on the status of the Temple Mount issue uh, as well. Temple Mount issue is uh, is is getting significantly worse. Um, uh, quickly, um, the uh, when when Israel took over, um, liberated that area in nineteen sixty seven. Um, the Jews allowed the Arab Waqf to be in control of that area. And uh, as of now, Jews are essentially prevented from praying there other than a few hours a day. When, uh, when it happens, it is with a tremendous amount of, of Arab intimidation. Um, I think you'll be seeing more of that because more and more and more Israelis are becoming aware of this issue. And it's not just a religious issue, it's a sovereignty issue. And it's frankly, it's a humil humiliation. Um, and I think it's something that we've been, I've been involved with bringing many congressmen and foreign, foreign officials to come to Temple Mount and to see how the Palestinians treat the Israelis, treat Jews, and it's, uh, it's disgusting. Um, and I think that as more and more people have this experience, um, it, it'll, the light will be shed on it and hopefully will have, a, have an impact. But in the meantime, it's getting worse. Um, and we even have Europeans who are now saying that the excavations, the archaeological evidence that the Temple Mount was always a Jewish area, um, that it's fabricated. And this is already, this is pressure from the Arabs in the archaeological environments um, in Europe, um, trying, to, trying to say that what we're, what we're doing, just our basic science, basic archaeology is a lie. That's the only thing they have left is just to continue lying. I know I went over the 30 seconds, so I apologize yeah, that, for that. Yeah, that's um, that's okay. <laughs> 
That's okay. It was, it was actually very, <laughs> very interesting. Some great commentary, and and clearly, uh, more than anything else, you could see what we desperately need here is quality leadership because it's 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 a it's a powder keg that is getting worse and worse and worse. And you need strong leadership, but you need ethical leadership. And unfortunately, we 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 have way too many uh, irrational actors. So. Uh, I've got I've got the Medora Zaran joining us momentarily. Somebody uh, somebody that you know. So we're gonna we're gonna take this uh, to yeah. the other side of the aisle. Obviously, feel free to continue to listen. Uh, Ellen, <laughs> uh, always a pleasure yes. having you join us. Uh, do you want to uh, very quickly let our uh, listeners know where they could uh, find you or learn more about your agency? You know, Twitter is a great way to find me. It's um, at e p i e p r z. Uh, that's probably the best way to find and interact with me. Um, and there's also the Yesha Council dot org. Um, but either of those, um, I'd love to see you. And next time you're in Israel, um, contact me by Twitter or, or, or contact the show, and uh, they'll direct them to you. They'll direct you to me. Excellent, Ellie. Thanks so much. Uh, God bless and have a wonderful evening. <laughs> Bye now. Thank you so much. All the best. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>